So welcome along today to how co-ops can empower communities. So this is a webinar which is brought to you by the Hive Business Support Programme. And the Hive is delivered by Cooperatives UK in partnership with the Cooperative Bank. And the Hive offers tailored business support to start up an existing co-ops. And this is one of a series of webinars to introduce people to co-ops and to signpost, uh, signpost people to support that you might need to help you start and develop and grow a cooperative organisation. So a little bit on what we're going to cover today. We're going to start off by just looking at what is a cooperative and then a little overview for myself on what is Community Shares. I'm John Dawson and I, I head up the Community Shares unit here at Cooperatives UK. But with us today, we're very fortunate to have some really excellent speakers. Uh, three have come along today to share their experience and knowledge and to be able to answer um, any questions you have as well. So we'll be starting off um, after me with Sarah Batten, the, co the founding co-director of the, the exchange in Erith. We'll then pass on to James Hartley, the CEO of Leeds Action to Create Homes, or better known as Latch. And then finally, Andy Walsh, the head of the National Game and Community Ownership at the Football Supporters Association. We'll then cover uh, at the end just a little bit of support that we have available to help you uh, with starting a co-op both from the Hive and we also have support through our Community Shares Booster Fund and we'll have an opportunity to look at any other questions that have come in and try and answer those now and any that we can't answer um, today we will get back to you um, so we'll, we'll have your email address and we'll be able to get back to you with any, any further bits that might be helpful as well. So just to start off some of you may be familiar with cooperatives some of you less so just to give you an overview of what is a cooperative. So a cooperative is a business or an organisation that's owned and controlled by its members to meet their shared needs. They're not owned by distant shareholders who hold all the power or take profits out of the business in an extractive way with little involvement with the running of the business or much interest in it. It's very different to that. It means the people closest to the business are the ones who benefit from its success. It also means that co-ops don't just focus on making a profit, they focus on how they make it, what they do with the profit, and how they bring value to their members and the community. So cooperatives can be all sorts of different types of business models. There's just a few listed on the screen in front of you, pubs, energy suppliers, taxi firms, etc. But really they crop up in every different type of um, sector and different type of uh, business and community in, in society. In the UK, we know there's more than 7,000 co-ops globally, more than 3 million. Uh, Co-ops in the UK are contributing over 40 billion to the economy, so they're a really important part of the economy. We also know they're a very resilient business model. In 2021 alone, they were five times less likely to close than more traditional business models. And they're also a very proven vehicle for collective action, for enabling people to come together to tackle common goals and common challenges in their communities. At the heart of Every co-op really, it's about the members. And the members can be the customers, the employees, might be residents, might be suppliers. And they all have a say in how that cooperative works. The members put something in and they get something out. So each member contributes and also receives something in return. That contribution could be working for the cooperative, it could be investing in the cooperative. It might be shopping or trading with the cooperative, but it's about having that connection, that daily regular connection with the cooperative. And they are a very democratic structure. So no matter how much you trade with a cooperative, no matter how much you might invest with a cooperative, each member receives one vote. So it provides for a very democratic and accountable mechanism, which is very different to how a more traditional company structure might operate. Over the last decade, we've seen a real growth in communities coming together to look at the cooperative model as a means of working together and finding solutions for common problems that they might have in their communities. Uh, we know that they can help to create solutions that meet people's needs and to help revitalize neighborhoods. We've got examples today um, that really help to show how people have done this as well in their communities. Uh, and many, many community-based cooperatives have looked at and started to use community shares which we're going to cover a lot more this afternoon. So since 2012, 
over 200 million pounds has been raised through community shares and that's by over 128,000 individual investors in communities putting their own money into projects that they're interested in that they care about and supporting uh, the common endeavors of, of projects that they think uh, that they, they want to support. To give you an example of what community shares are, they are a flexible form of raising finance and also building a membership. So they're unique to cooperative and community benefit societies. It's very different from debt finance and from grant finance. It's also much more, uh, it's a much more involved relationship than um, traditional crowdfunding as well. What they are is withdrawable rather than transferable share capital. And this is different to private businesses. The value of community shares doesn't fluctuate and it isn't speculative in the sense that more private shares are in private businesses. They can't be traded on markets, but instead they're withdrawn from the society gradually and over time. As a result of this, they're a very patient but also flexible way of raising finance. But they also put the power in the hands of the individual communities using community shares in the sense that you set the terms of the share offer. You're not going to a lender and having to accept what interest rates or what terms that they offer you, but actually you create those terms and you go out to your community with those terms. So the following types of organisations registered with the Financial Conduct Authority can carry out a community share offer. So these are cooperative societies, community benefit societies, or a community benefit society with charitable additional charitable status. And they're really on a bit of a spectrum there of who benefits from the organisation. So a cooperative society is quite focused on the members involved with that society. A community benefit society is a bit broader, seeking to benefit the community. And the charitable structure on top of that would be about creating wider public benefit in addition to that. All of these three different models here uh, can offer share interest, so interest on shares, and they would all plan to gradually return the share capital over time to investors. The cooperative society, in addition to that, can also offer dividends. So why might people use community shares? As well as the stat we said earlier about cooperatives being a very resilient business model, our research into community shares has found that 92% of organisations who have carried out a community share offer are still trading, which compares very favourably with more commercial uh, businesses. We know that they also help to attract and lever in other investments. So for every pound raised by the community through community shares, on average, they've levered in an additional £1.18 on top of that, often through debts or through grants or through other types of investment into the organisation. But they do also attract lots of local investment, which is really attractive to other funders, being able to say that you've got individuals from your community who have invested their own money in a project is a really compelling story when you go and seek investment from other funders. But also, we know people aren't just investing for the financial returns but they are investing because of the wider social and environmental benefits. And usually these are very visible projects that are within people's communities that they can touch and feel, they can engage with on a daily basis, their stories that are really appealing to those individuals. So in terms of how community shares work, they usually start off with a need to raise finance. And it could be a different type of finance, uh, it might be a very early stage organisation seeking to raise a bit of startup capital or a bit of working capital. Sometimes they are much larger projects seeking to raise large sums of capital investment for a specific project, of which they'll have worked up much more detailed plans. And other times, particularly in recent years, we've seen organisations look at community shares as a way of pivoting a business model or recapitalising their balance sheet to bring in new working capital and new investments, but from an established organisation. At the very start of this, it is very beneficial to engage your community, to speak to people that you work with daily, be that geographic or other individuals that you work with, and understand what their needs, what their motivations might be, and what, they, what their interest would be in a community share offer. By engaging your community, you can start to understand the potential for community shares, the amount you may be able to raise, 
as well as the minimum amounts that you might set your share offer at, the minimum amount that individuals might invest. By starting to do that, you can work out how many people might invest in your share offer and how much overall you might raise and what sort of timescales you might need to do that. But it should also help you to influence your share offer, your business plan, to get a better idea of how you're creating a business model that's a benefit for those potential future members. As well as that, as you're developing your plans for a share offer, we would recommend that you develop a detailed business plan that gives you an opportunity to speak to your community about what your plans are, as well as offering a developing a share offer document and starting to plan out a campaign, which is often one area which individuals uh, don't necessarily spend enough time on. Um, preparing the campaign for a share offer is something um, that is very important and that's at the heart of how you reach the individuals and get them to finally switch over to wanting to become an investor in your organisation. So the Community Shares Unit at Cooperatives UK can help you understand all of these things, speak to individuals who've done this in the past. Uh, and we have a lot of documents and examples we can give to help people do that. There are just three examples on the screen, which I'll go through very quickly. But we've also obviously got a couple of examples with us today as well. These are organisations through our booster fund we've supported in the last 12 months. So bottom left, we've got the Kingsley Holt Centre in Staffordshire who raised money to save the last remaining community asset really um, in their village. This was a Methodist chapel, which was closing down and being sold off on the open market. They raised 140,000 pounds from 125 investors. They also raised um, some loan finance that sat alongside that. And they recently completed the purchase of that building, which they're going to use as a community hub and to put a community shop in there as well. For the East Marsh in um, Grimsby, they raised half a million pounds from 162 investors. And this was to buy housing um, on the East Marsh Estates, which had got into a very rundown state. Uh, they're going to refurbish those houses. Their plan is with half a million pounds to buy and refurbish 10 houses and to let them on affordable terms. And then finally, the Friends of the Joiners Arms raised 128,000 pounds, but from a very impressive over 2,000 investors. And this was to save a LBGT plus uh, facility in their community, which was closing down. They raised the money to try and open a new uh, facility for the queer community. And that was a very different type of share offer. But you can see the three here, very different business models, very different geographic communities, but all looking towards community shares as a means of both raising investment, but also attracting individuals to be long-term supporters, members and investors within, within their cooperative community organisation. So as I said earlier, Cooperatives UK can help you with the registration of the legal model that can underpin a community share offer. So we can help you look at model rules for a society and work out with whether a community share offer might work for you and how we get the right legal structure to do that. We have something called the Community Shares Standard Mark, which is an external verification of a share offer document, which we can help you to look through. We can help you to achieve the Community Shares Standard Mark to make sure that the offer you're taking out to your community meets a certain quality threshold. We have also a lot of guidance on community shares, which we've put together in something called the Community Shares Handbook, which tells you about the legislative framework for community shares. So we can help you to work through any uh, legal queries you've got on it and we can help you find experienced practitioners who've been there and done this and these are our community shares practitioners so we can help you work through those and find someone who can help you uh, with preparing all the documents you might need for a share offer and then finally one of our functions is actually providing development support grants um, and investments to grow the community shares market so we can provide business advice if you're an organisation that's at very, very early stages of thinking about a share offer. We have development grants, which you could use to help to pay an advisor to help prepare a community share offer document. It might help you to achieve the community share standard mark or to plan out a campaign. We have uh, ongoing investments that we can provide as well. So we can provide matched equity investments, which the three examples earlier, we provided investments into. Um, as well as uh, Latch and Erith Exchange who are here today. And that works investing alongside community investors to help leverage in 
investment from individuals. And then finally, if we do invest in organisations, uh, we then create an ongoing role and relationship with your organisation. We are then an active investor and we're very interested in how you um, continue to deliver your business plan and we're there to help support you along the way as you develop and grow as an organisation. So that just gives you a bit of a flavour um, of the Community Shares Booster Fund and how we can help you. But now I'm going to hand you over to Sarah from the exchange, who's just going to give you uh, a few slides and a little bit of an overview of their organisation. So, hi, I'm Sarah, Sarah Batten, and I'm a, a founding co-director of uh, The Exchange. Um, we're a community-owned organisation and community-founded, um, a charitable community benefit society, um, a place where people make and make things happen. Uh, we are based at Erisod Library. Um, the building was built in 1906 and it served the community as a library and museum as a place for local empowerment for over 100 years before being closed in 2009, owing to lack of funds and major dilapidations. If you don't know where Erith is, um, it's on the banks of the Thames uh, in the Greater London Borough of Bexley or Historic Kent. Um, and when the library was built, Erith was a thriving place, not just a town, but a district, which is roughly sort of North Bexley today. And it was responsible for its own transport systems, healthcare and power production. The industrial community were the ones that commissioned the library. Um, it was funded by philanthropist Andrew Carnegie um, and uh, the community ensured that the building of the library was a process that also supported the local economy. So it was designed and built by local people using local materials and showcased the work of local crafts and trades. In 2014, uh, me and my husband moved to Erith, um, which by then had become a bit forgotten. Um, at the time, I was working for the Church's Conservation Trust, finding new uses for historic churches, and Pete was at the Garden Museum looking after the historic building and working on exhibitions. Every day we would walk past this building and feel quite sad that it was lying there, derelict, at the gateway to the town, and we weren't, in the end, the only ones that felt this way about the building and about Erith in general. It took seeing an article about regeneration money, Greater London Authority funds coming into the area to make us approach the council. Uh, we wrote them an email explaining who we are, were and what we were interested in doing for and with the community through the old library. We were entered into a competition where the council was looking for an organisation to take on the management of the building and unexpectedly we won. Um, that was at the end of 2016. Um, and then soon after we were legally constituted and began growing the exchange as a community organisation, focusing on um, making Eris a better place to live. What we had been told by the council in regards to funding didn't quite turn out to be true. Um, we were told at the point of developing the proposal that all the money had been secured for the repair of the building and um, the renovation works, including M&E, or we would have to fundraise for was the fit out. Actually, this turned out not to be true. Um, there was enough money uh, just to deal with a, a significant repair works, but not the roof. We had to find another 200,000 for that. Um, and uh, it would only renovate the lower ground floor and it's a three story building. This caused a bit of a conundrum. Um, we were a newly constituted group with very little money in the bank account. So we didn't have the money to, um, to cash flow a major capital project. So uh, we ended up going into closer partnership with the council, where then named as the lead applicant on the Heritage Fund application, but where we did all the fundraising and activity work and a lot of the management of the construction works as well. The biggest challenge we had was getting the legal stuff sorted. Um, it was probably the area of the projects that caused the most sleepless nights um, and it was the only time we considered pulling out. Luckily, we had a, with great solicitors and we were growing a really supportive community and a supportive board around us, uh, but it literally took years to get the lease and partnership agreement um, with the council that we were comfortable with. But the best bit, and is still the best bit, is uh, working with the people. So, and people have been involved in every step of the journey through early sort of mapping out what the possibilities of that space could be, also the issues that people were most concerned about. Um, people suggested activities and um, events that we should trial and then feedback on them. Um, so we did lots of stuff from uh, workshops, craft workshops to family activities, to outdoor events, mini festivals. 
Um, the uh, residents have also been involved in sort of developing our governance structure, and we now have got a really strong community board. Um, and the community completely lead on our events programme. So we support them to happen, but it's the community's idea of what happens there. So we've had cultural days exploring um, South Asian culture and uh, Roma Gypsy Traveller heritage. We've had beer festivals. We've had history tours and trails, lots and lots of different workshops. And we also work closely with young people through the college. So they um, de developed a series of events, including a drag event at another local heritage site. The community has also like, worked with us on defining who we are um, and what we're here to do. So this is our kind of concise framework. So our purpose is building a community of makers. So it's very much grounded in the heritage of the building. So by makers, we mean, um, yes, craft, but also people that make stuff happen. So the three pillars that run through everything we do are empowerment. So making sure people have um, the opportunities to make that change. Uh, community, so opportunities to bring people together. Um, and that craft, so really focusing on craft skills and that process of craft and what that can sort of teach us around quality of what we do. And then we have a series of ends. So these are our aims and these are sort of divided, uh, devised by the community and um, updated quite regularly, focusing on things that we need to deal with in, a, in order to become the organisation that we want to be. So championing cultural diversity, tackling racism, tackling the climate emergency, tackling poor mental health, for example. So what have we achieved? So uh, during the pandemic, we became community owned um, and we run a community share campaign supported by Co-ops UK. Um, because it was during the pandemic, we couldn't do any physical work. So we had a group of about 70 or 80 uh, local ambassadors who helped us by talking to their neighbours, sharing on social media. Um, but we were able to raise 150,000 with 435 shareholders. And now we have more, more members as well. And there's a video, I'll share the link um, to our shares film. Um, the bookstore, so this is our community cafe, uh, so it's run by a talented local chef, Louisa, who's now also a co-director of the exchange, it's doing pretty well, things are a little bit difficult at the moment, um, but the, the community really wanted something very different in terms of a food offer, um, and also a nighttime offer, because um, Erif goes a bit quiet in the evening, and the bookstore does that. The renovation works are now complete in terms of the big stuff, so the builders left at the end of last year, um, and now we've got a beautiful main space where we run all our events. This is our, we call this our town square. Um, and the frontage now looks like, doesn't look like a building site and it doesn't look derelict, new railings, etc. cetera. Um, we also have a beautiful garden. So there never was a garden in this place, but green space was really important to, to uh, the community. So we work with um, award-winning garden designer, Sarah Price, who designed the garden and now it was all planted and is maintained by volunteers. Um, and then around our main town square space where we hold our events, we've got a series of workshops and these workshops, um, the idea is they're free to access, but people come in and they make things that we can either use, the community can use or that we can sell. Um, so this is the timber workshop where they've been making tables and chairs. So the tables uh, efficiently store on the walls, which you'll see just in the background, but they also mimic the old panelling. Um, but we've now made enough that we uh, that we need, so we're going to start selling them. And the chairs have just started being in production now. Uh, the textiles groups, we've got about 45 uh, local residents who come in weekly to skill up on embroidery, and we started making things to sell. And we're also launching a community repair service to try and deal with textile waste, because waste is quite a big issue in our, in our area. Um, and then we have a, a print group, design and print. Um, so probably about 50 people who come not every week, but come to design things that we can then print for exhibitions and also again for sale. And then ceramics workshops, the last one to open as it's just launched. Um, and there's a couple of projects that we're running. Um, and so local residents come in and help us to make tableware for the bookstore, the restaurant. Um, and they're also making tiles using uh, wild clay. So they've been taking uh, clay out of the river um, and uh, we'll be making tiles that go around all our sink units. And again, we'll sell them once we've made enough. Uh, another key success is our local partnerships. So one thing is there's the core empowerment thing. It's not just about the exchange, but it's also about the town in general and the organizations that exist there. So during the pandemic, we formed a partnership with uh, about 27 other local organizations and we work together to promote ERIF better. So this is our new website, but also to work on town-wide events. So Erith Made is our, uh, in its second year, we've just had our second festival and it's um, all the town uh, organisations working together to put on live events 
uh, and workshops and all sorts in the different venues. Um, so there's food, live music, concerts, dog shows, cat exhibitions, all sorts. But the idea is to showcase the town um, and hopefully we can do more and more of this kind of thing. Um, so that is a summary of the exchange, a place where people make and make things happen. Thank you, Sarah. That was brilliant. Um, amazing to see such a transformation there and so many fabulous pictures. I really liked the very, very clear vision you set for the organisation as well, which seems to then shine through in all those pictures. So thank you. Uh, we're going to move on next to James. James is from Latch in Leeds. James, over to you. Hi there, everybody. Can, uh, can I kind of be seen and heard? Excellent. Yeah. Sort my screen out a little bit better. That's better. Okay, so um, my name is James Hartley. I'm the uh, Chief Executive of LATCH, which stands for Leeds Action to Create Homes. LATCH is a community benefit society which was founded in 1989. And essentially, our mission is to provide homes to homeless people. Um, I've been at Latch around 24 years. I started in building uh, as a bricklayer originally when I left school and worked in construction for a number of years. And then uh, when I moved to Latch in about 1998, um, Latch was my dream job. It was my opportunity to use my building and construction skills that I had, as well as help people. And that was a key motivation and Latch was a fantastic place to do that. Our mission at Latch is simple. It states it here, it speaks for itself, creating positive change in people's lives through housing, training and support. It's an holistic approach that tries to maximise the impacts of bringing empty properties into use and having these impacts around housing, training and support. Central to our work is our values. We do a lot of work around this in terms of staff recruitment, staff induction and working with our membership. And as you can see there, compassion, integrity, creativity, and collaboration and quality. They're the core values that we try to express in the way we work with people, the way we treat each other and where we respond to opportunities to move things forward. Essentially, we deliver free services. We have property services, supported housing, and our coach house. The property services provides property management. We own and manage approximately 106 properties. These are let to homeless people who have support needs. Currently housing about 180 people if you include the dependents. Within Leeds, there's seven to eight, seven, seven to eight thousand people who are on the prior to year list. So the demand for housing and service like ours is really high. In terms of property development, we bring back into use long-term empty properties and most of those 109 properties come from that source. At this moment in time, there's approximately 4,000 long-term empty properties in Leeds. So as you can see, there's demand and also the supply and our challenge is often to find the resources in which to, uh, to do that. We also um, provide training and volunteering opportunities on our property refurbishments. I wanna say a bit more about that in a minute. Supported housing. All our tenants are formerly homeless people with support needs and they're recruited through a number of routes through the local authority, through referral partners and self-referrals. And our coach house is a newer service that we've uh, implemented, which again, I'll say more about in a moment. So when it comes to the trainees and volunteers on our refurbishments, these are the key objectives really. Training and employment, looking to develop confidence and self-esteem and create energy efficient homes. So we do that through recruiting trainees. As it's like um, recruiting for employment. We'll, we'll advertise the opportunities. People will apply, they'll be interviewed, and then they'll be recruited onto the, the project. During the project, they'll have training in a range of construction skills. We'll undergo health and safety training, and we'll seek to try and get everyone CSCS cards to enable them to develop their careers in construction. Historically, we've managed to recruit and to create permanent employment on the latch team for many of our trainees. And of the current team of about nine people, I think half of them approximately would have been uh, trainees originally. So that's how we sustain the employment. For many, it's not so much about skills and construction and jobs. It's about somewhere to be during the day, about confidence, self-esteem and bringing routine. 
and also around energy efficiency, we seek to do retrofit works on the properties where possible and where affordable. And the objective there is to create the homes so they're affordable for our tenants uh, when they move in. And we do some super insulation works on that, which you'll see a bit more of in a minute. When it comes to supported housing, um, the tenants are moved in. Every tenant has a dedicated support worker, focuses around changing people's lives. The support is needs led. It's not done to a prescription from external sources. We currently use the Home Star, which enables us to provide a structured support service to people. And the idea is, is that you'll have a successful ten tenancy with Latch and then move on to your own tenancy. And we try to achieve that within one to two years. Some people stay longer. And the focus is, is it when it's ready for you, when it's your time to move, is how we um, how we will respond to that. The coach house is something new. It's a, a building near our offices that we developed several years ago. And it's run as like a community hub, really, to provide various activities. So a lot of community groups come in and use it for spaces. Um, we let um, some psychotherapy takes place for our tenants. There's people fixing bikes. There's a women's group using it. And various things and in a sense latch just makes that building available to people to use and the idea is for when our tenants participate we're providing housing there's the training and the support and then the coach house is a kind of a sense to build upon all of that work do something more positive and productive and realize people's skills and potential obviously to do all that we need money and these are examples of people who funded us over the recent years can see all the uh, different examples there. I'm just going to focus in on Cooperatives UK, seeing as that's the, uh, hosting the event. But we recently did a community share issue, which ran last year. Um, and um, we started off, we obtained a booster, £10,000 from the booster fund, and also obtained match funding, match investment up to uh, £100,000 from Cooperatives UK. And we had a target raise of £350,000 to buy and develop six new homes and we actually raised five hundred and fifty thousand pounds and now in the process of spending that to create some new homes the crucial factor in leads for us is lead city council they have something called the right to buy right to buy grant program which enables us to access approximately 40 percent of the capital for any project that you want to do so it really is a foundational to many of the other combinations the funding that we do and essentially we secure the majority of the funding through that route and loan or share issue and then go look for other bits of grant to enhance the project's impact around the training and the other elements we have a really good track record of securing significant amounts of funding um, from those routes when it comes to the impact we like to um, identify these key areas of impact I'm just going to pick on change lives really as one as an example. So with that regard, um, if you go to our website, you'll see our annual report. There's a good example of a former latch tenant who came and stayed with us three to four years and now works as a nurse. Her life is transformed, her family life is stable, and she says some wonderful things about the work that latch did. So in each of our interventions, be it around properties, support, training, and the coach, it's trying to have an impact on people's lives. In terms of changing and helping them make that journey and then the other one perhaps to emphasize is training employment currently recruiting more and more of our trainees into latch so latch can grow bigger latch can do more properties and develop further and each of these outcomes is uh, the focus and driver of what we do i'm now just going to show you a short video
And just finally, um, I was just going to say about our future plans, really. Um, we'll continue and doing what we've always done, as I've mentioned, there's several, 300,000, 3,000 long-term empties in Leeds, there's 8,000 people with high priority housing. So the need for properties continues and there's plenty to do. So we'll be looking for more grant funding. We're considering doing a new share issue in the new year. Um, we're looking to broaden our fundraising activities around donations and um, regular giving. We seek to um, grow our coach house service even more, make that more available to the community. And we're also exploring the opportunities that may come to us through becoming a registered provider and perhaps looking at registered charity status. So as we've always done, creating homes, changing lives, that's what Latch focuses on and what we continue to do. So thank you for giving me the uh, opportunity to speak. Thank you, James. Incredible the way to see those houses. Uh, you make it look very easy and very quick, both of you, um, creating all that different change. And some very interesting bathroom suite colours you were removing there. I know. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I did particularly like the, uh, the coach house as well. Uh, the way that seems to be very people focused. So the way you're branching out there, that's, that's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Andy, over to you now. So I'm going to hand you over to Andy Walsh from the Football Supporters Association. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Andy Walsh. I'm the head of the National Game and Community Ownership of the Football Supporters Association. I'm just going to uh, run through with you today um, what we do, our community ownership model, which clubs use the model and how we use that model to, to uh, create community assets through football. Um, football Sports Association is Europe's largest democratic supporter representative body, over half a million members. Um, we represent supporters in England and Wales, and we have a network of sister organisations across the world, really, but predominantly um, connected with other fan groups in, in Europe. Um, as a, in terms of community ownership and um, cooperatives and mutuals, we've supported the establishment of over 50 community-owned clubs in the last 24 years um, and also established over 200 community benefit societies. We represent football fans and clubs from the top of the game right the way through to the grassroots, both on the men's and women's side. And we've been major contributors to the recent fan-led review of, um, of football um, conducted by the government last year. We've got representatives on the major um, FA Council, and we have regular meetings with, with parliamentarians. Um, as our community-owned clubs, there are currently 45 community-owned clubs, um, all follow slightly different models, but all based upon the Community Benefit Society, where the supporters come together, collectivise um, their, uh, their, their support and their ownership of their football club through a Community Benefit Society. Three of those clubs are in the professional game, and the rest are in the non-league, including two other clubs within, um, two clubs which are, in the, which are in the Welsh leagues. Quite often, we are, we're acting as a blue light service, so clubs that fall on a hard times or crash under previous ownership models, they turn to us for, for support. And um, we see a list of clubs there that we've assisted, former and former league clubs that are now. Uh, the model, as I mentioned, is a community benefit society, as mentioned in the introduction. It allows us to um, use that model to, to raise community shares, which is often a vital source of funding when, um, when taking the flood into community ownership, either for capital development around the ground or for actually setting up uh, community activities within the uh, The reason we use community benefit society model is it is a democratically controlled corporate structure, which is important in terms of limiting liability on directors. It's also important not just for community share fundraising, but for other fundraising, and gives some um, governance quality um, that is otherwise missing if we didn't use a incorporated structure. And finally, the community benefit society allows the members to own property. And a number of our clubs uh, will own their ground. They'll also own a, a subsidiary company, which will have a license to play in FA sanctioned competitions. 
The um, FSA used a set of model rules. What that means is, is that the Financial Conduct Authority allow us to develop model rules with, um, which are approved by the Financial Conduct Authority, which makes the registration of Community Benefit Society a lot easier. Um, those model rules have five key objectives, all focused on delivering community benefit. Sustainable business model, the mutual ownership, enhancing the cultural, social and economic value of the club within its community, providing facilities for the whole of the local community, not just the football community. And of course, the primary function of any football club is to be playing football at the highest level. So it's key here for us is that the directors of our community benefit owned football clubs, the primacy is delivering benefit to the community through football. Um, so football and the wider mutual movement is, is very important to us as an organisation. Many football clubs will talk about being community models and being community assets. But then what does, in, in reality, what does that mean? Most supporters and members of the community have very, have very little interaction with the business decisions that uh, the football clubs make. And in the community benefit society model, is clearly a central plank of the, uh, of the of running of the football club. And we've gained tremendous experience from uh, working with other mutuals and other co-ops that has benefited um, not just our community benefit societies, our football clubs, but also a broader understanding of what's possible. Um, we were very fortunate um, to be part of the Co-op UK pilot project on community shares back in 2011, 2012, I think. Um, and um, myself, I was a part of that pilot project. Um, I was involved, I've been involved in half a dozen different community share um, issues. And um, the one cl the club that I was the general manager at, we raised over two million pounds towards the funding of the stadium. That two million pounds then allowed us to leverage in additional funding, as, as John outlined in in the uh, in the presentation at the beginning. But that raising money yourself within the society shows the commitment of the group itself and allows to bring in uh, additional funding. Um, it became a real game changer for us in football. We have now raised something close to five or six million pounds through football uh, clubs in in community shares. And we work closely with Corps UK in that respect and the Hive. Um, we don't claim to be experts. We probably do one community share offer a year. But it's important that we retain our links with Corps UK and Corps UK's um, specialist community advisors. Whilst we have some um, some very um, extensive knowledge of community shares in our sector, we're always looking to bring in best practice from other sectors and always work with Corps UK. Um, and. As an organisation, we're looking to build our mutual movement. So we're looking to ensure that supporters themselves understand the benefits and the experience that can be drawn from, from other mutual societies through training, education, networking. And we encourage all our clubs um, to support each other. That's me. Thank you, Andy. That was great. Um, possibly no better place than football and particularly at the moment to think about um, how you get more voice and ownership uh, into, into the world of football um, and getting that member's voice, I think it's really important. Um, so thank you for that. I think the three examples we've had there show us three very different types of communities, three different types of business models, but all looking to both raise investments and build, build that community and have members voice within what they're trying to do and showing really successful ways of doing that so thanks all uh, i'm just going to share my screen and just put up the last couple of slides on support that the hive can provide for organizations and then we'll come on to questions so uh, so a good place to start is also we have a free online step-by-step -step tool uh, which can talk you and walk you through the different uh, questions you might need to ask as a as a new start or as a as a community based organisation, with working out whether cooperative structure is right for you, what type of cooperative structure, um, and how you think about things like a business plan um, and the governance 
and the next steps you might need to make, working out what sort of advice and information uh, you might need to get hold of as well. So that is all on the website. That's a free tool that you can make use of, which is a great starting point. Um, you can also access up to 10 days tailored business support, mentoring and training for startup uh, cooperatives. So we can give you support um, to access a cooperative development expert. The sport is designed to meet the needs of the startup and it can include deciding on the most appropriate type of co-op model and the structure for your needs, looking at the governance of your co-op, supporting with incorporation, the registration of that legal body that sits uh, sits on top of, of what you want to do. Um, we can help you with developing membership criteria, understanding who the members should be, how you want to interact with them. We can help you to design a member engagement strategy, perhaps a training plan to uh, work with, with uh, your fellow, fellow individuals seeking to develop these plans. We can support you through our advisors with business planning, testing out the ideas, perhaps looking at where finance might exist, how you might go about raising that finance, Heard a lot about community shares today, so perhaps understanding whether community shares is the right route for you. Um, and we also have the opportunity for things like peer mentoring and skills training and speaking to existing cooperatives, and we can network you in with those. So really good, uh, good lots of different types of support that's available there. That's the link again. So that's just uk.coop slash start. We have a few minutes left. So I'm just going to open it up now to any questions. Apologies there, someone said that my sound was, was troubling. I think Zoom just restarted on me, but I think we're back now. So we have a question here from Amy. What role do members play in decision-making more specifically? Please, could you give examples of which decisions they are, are not directly involved in? Do all members have an equal say or do some groups have a particularly important status because of their role in the organisation? How do you keep people involved over time? Um, Sarah, if I come to you first, and then perhaps Andy, you have your hand up as well. Um, so yes, everyone has this equal say. Um, we also elect our board from our membership or the membership elects the board and they are there to represent the views of the membership. Um, so they have probably a bit more of a say and we meet them uh, quarterly and often a bit more than that. Uh, we have an annual AGM where we, we bring up key issues. So last year we really focused on uh, live music. People wanted a lot of live music, but people don't understand how much it costs to bring bands and stuff down. So we had a big discussion around that. Um, and then this year, uh, we, we focus a bit on the sort of cost of living stuff and the impact on the, the restaurant. Um, uh, but yeah, everyone has an equal say. I think the other thing to say is, although we have a membership of about 470 now, we are there for the whole community and there's people coming in who aren't members who we still want to hear from. So there's people that run events and lead events have got ideas that we still support them, even though they're not members. Um, so it's also about collecting views in so the members and the board especially are very much involved in being that uh, sounding board for us and making sure that we are there for the whole community and not just the membership um yeah does that answer the question that's great sarah yeah thank you andy did you want to come in uh yeah just i've put i've put a reply in the chat uh, and i'm happy amy if you want to contact me afterwards to talk about it if you've got some specific questions but within our model rules um uh, pretty much the same as Sarah we um, we have the provision for electing a board um, we also have the provision for the board to to appoint a uh, an operations board for, for what of a better phrase um, so who can run the uh, society on a day-to-day -day ba basis run the business on a day-to-day uh, -day basis who are then responsible to the board the board are responsible to the members um, so it's not members being involved in 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 the day to day running of the, of the of the society, but it's very important for the members to be available because um, it's part of the capital of the of the society is the members' skills and uh, and experience. So um, it's a delegated authority structure that we have. Um, again, similar to Sarah, regular meetings are encouraged through the year, so it's not just a general meeting; it's just regular uh, regular events. And we encourage as many members as possible to be involved uh, through our model. Hope that helps. 
I just wanted to add as well, so we run on a policy governance basis as well, which um, really clearly maps out what the board is there to do and what the executive are there to do. So the purpose of this, which we worked with very closely on our board, was to make sure that the exactly um, as exactly as Andy said, is that they don't get too involved in the day to day, which they don't necessarily understand, and that the discussions at the governance level are really useful and focus on impacts and moving forward rather than on you know, toilet paper and um, plugs or something. <laughs> Very operational, yeah. Thank you, Sarah. James, any thoughts from you on the role of members within your organisation, especially all those new members you've taken on as investors? Yeah. We, we, we were quite cautious about with the new members. So we actually create two categories of membership. We have the core supporters, core members and support members with the investors being classed as support members. There was some concern about an influx of 150 or more uh, members perhaps taking latch in a different direction. So there is a little bit of an imbalance now. It's quite awkward to, at moments to, to justify and discuss that. And, um, you know, but it was out of a consideration what if someone started to suggest as an investor we buy to develop or to sell or something like that. So there's an element of trying to keep it in that regard. We have a, it's the most challenging area for this because if you imagine our, our key people are really our tenants, service users, and their issues when they join Latch are not how Latch runs. Their issues are my housing, my support, my other needs. So we do, they are members and they're involved in every way we can possibly can, but it's mostly consultation and um, engagement with their support workers that brings their voice into the organisation. But it does tax us quite a lot how to give them more power and more authority within the organisation. And we've not cracked it perfectly, but um, we encourage it and welcome it as best we possibly can. And um, it's something we'll probably continue to strive to do better always. But yeah, it's Thanks, um, it's not um, um, something we... Where did you go issues. for advice on those different membership categories? It was um, Dave Boyle was um, our consultant and he advised us on the share issue document and part of your funding was to review our rules so um and we've been through two agms under the new rules and they've not been an issue yet and none of the supporter members have um complained <laughs> um i don't know publicly okay. anyway they might grumble <laughs> but you know consensus is the way forward and i think where is as, as we are now, we're all working together in the same direction. There is no matters of contention. So these issues probably lay dormant until, say, Latch tried to go in a very different direction. Yeah. And then it may come out a little bit, but no. It's all that. Okay. It's an happy ship at the moment. Thanks, James. So worth seeking one of the practitioners we can put you in touch with, like Dave Devon. Thank you. A quick question. I don't know if there'll be a quick answer, but the quick question was, are any of your organisations charitable so do you have charitable status on top of your um structure andy you were first with your hand up no <laughs> right quick answer thank you um and that is presumably because football doesn't fall within the charity one of the charitable purposes or objects correct yeah and charity yeah, permission. Yeah, yeah sorry you haven't put your hand up but i'm coming to you anyway <laughs> oh you're on mute uh, yeah, we're charitable, not registered with the Charities Commission, but um, Charitable Community Benefits Society. So we get the tax benefits of being yeah. a charity. Uh, yeah, and have a Thank you, Sarah. And the technicalities there is you don't register with the Charity Commission, but you receive very similar charitable status, but instead given from HMRC. James? Yeah, similar to Sarah, really. We're, we are a charitable non-profit making and registered with FCA as such. So that involves the tax thing. We are looking at the registered charity states primarily because, as you've seen from our, my slide, there's a lot of grant funding goes on, and we're noticing that the absence of the registered charity number is becoming more significant as time progresses. It used to be one in five grants would require it. Now it's more like three to four. So we're playing with the idea. The only interest is to access grants rather than any other feature of it, and we're we're very against bureaucracy and external control and influence. It's probably me being a bit lazy, really. But um, so there's a resistance to doing it because of all the requirements that come with it. But I think over the coming one to two years, we probably will move in that direction or at least begin to explore it with some some certainty. 
Uh, us too, I think. Um, yeah, it's funding's getting more and more difficult to access, so we need more pots to go to, and it is a bit is becoming a bit of an issue for us too. Okay, thanks both. There's a question here. I think I'll try and paraphrase it, but is there an opportunity for more co-ops to be established to tackle home energy challenges? I guess cost of living crisis, cost of fuel, energy. James, it might be the obvious place to come back to you. Yeah, possibly. It depends on, on what your intervention is. We managed to do retrofit works and improve energy efficiency through building it into our property development program so the share issue and the grant funding would see that's part of the capital works but if you're going to address the uh, energy efficiency promise of existing housing one day some if the money could be found available there is an opportunity which we've looked at around becoming a social enterprise perhaps with a cooperative structure to provide those services elsewhere but the issue is the capital the capital intensive nature of that activity and, and we did run a social enterprise um, about 10 years ago when there was sufficient government subsidy to private citizens to be able to have those works undertaken. It worked quite well, but it's that, you know, it's quite capital intensive to do those works. So um, that that's a perspective I understand. The question may be broader than just the work. <laughs> okay, thanks, James. Uh, a question there about... Um, Not a membership. Is this a problem? Um, I suggest maybe just drop us a line. There are ways of converting from different legal structures to a cooperative or community benefit society structure. If that's something you want to do, uh, we can provide advice on how best to do that. And many organisations have done that. So there are there are ways of looking at this. Um, we are running over time a little bit, so I'd just like to come to the three of you. And Andy, if I come to you first, as you had your hand up there, but just with any final thoughts particularly in light of um the, the topic today about how we support more community cooperatives so any tips or final thoughts for organizations thinking of going down the route that you guys have been down but you went down it a few years ago so any learning uh, that you have as well just to inspire or help um, any individuals here today so andy uh, I think I think the, the the biggest lesson is to reach out and talk to other co-ops. By being a co-op, you have a responsibility under the principles of the co-op movement to assist other co-ops. If anybody does what a couple of co-ops did to did to me when I engaged this movement and say we're going to charge you for it, get in touch with Co-op UK because we're all you know this is about us all supporting each other and helping each other. Um, there are things that might be commercially sensitive. People are overstretched, as Sarah's already indicated, with, with just keeping their own enterprise running. So they've not always got the time. But don't be afraid to reach out. Better to ask the question than, than, uh, than to just sit there and uh, and think uh, you've got nobody to, reach, nobody to speak to. Great. Thanks, Andy. James? Yeah, I'd echo Andy's point about reaching out because there's a lot of knowledge and experience out there. In our case, our model, I think also the advice is not to underestimate how challenging it is. And if you think the multiple features that we deploy, we kind of make it as complicated as we possibly could. And there may be a way of starting with one element of the type of work we've done and adding the others over time. So I think it's, you know, be aware of what you're taking on. Use your own existing expertise and knowledge and reach out to others to build on that. Thank you, James. And then Sarah, finally from you. I think similar, um, but I think lean on people that are in your community as well. Don't take it all on yourself. This is for everybody living in your local area. So everybody should really play a part and everybody's got a different part to play. So really look for people's skills and experience within the community and ask them for support because usually they say yes. That's brilliant. Well, that's some very good advice there as well. Thank you. Uh, so thanks to all three of the panellists who've joined us today, to Andy, to Sarah, to James. If you are interested in finding out more about how you might want to start up a community-based cooperative, then follow this link here. We have lots of support available, be that through the Hive programme or our Community Shares Booster Fund. Uh, that's the starting point on the screen there. We will send out the slides We'll make sure a recording of this is available 
my colleague Jen has been really busy behind the scenes organising this and posting the links and organising all the speakers. So massive thanks to her. Sat there very quietly um, on your screens. Um, she's really made this happen behind the scenes. A lot of the links she's put there as well. We'll make sure we send those out to you afterwards as well. So you'll get to um, digest those in your own time. I know we've bombarded you with a lot of information today, but hopefully you found it really useful and inspiring. I found the talks and the images particularly uh, really, really great to see that transformation. So again, you know, there is support out there. Um, get in touch with us. Uh, it could just be a discussion to start with, as Andy said, going and speaking to other co-ops who've been there and done this is really invaluable as well. But hopefully we can hear from some of you and help you on your path and journey towards um, starting up perhaps a community-based cooperative and um, yeah, we'd love to be able to help some of you. So thanks to our speakers um, and thanks for joining us today and hopefully see you all again soon.